<clears throat> Hello, uh, today we'll talk about two very interesting architects, uh, an Italian architect, Leonardo Ricci, and a French architect, Jean Renaudie. I will start the presentations with um, the one on uh, Leonardo Ricci, who was born in 1918 and died in uh, 1994. Uh, so Leonardo Ricci uh, was born on, on June 8th and died on September 29th, was an Italian architect. Uh, born in Rome or according to other sources in Florence. He obtained his classical high school diploma in 1936 at the Liceo uh, Michelangelo in Florence and then enrolled in the Faculty of Architecture of the same city, meaning in Florence, where he graduated in 1941. After having had him as a pupil, Giovanni Michelucci, a remarkable architect, uh, hired him as, as his assistant. He remained in the Michelucci studio until 1946. In addition to practicing as an architect, he also became a professor of architectural composition, also teaching in the United States. He was awarded the gold medal at the 1957 Milan uh, Triennial or Triennale. Uh, this was the man. And he does look like uh, an homme revolte, an intense man, um, a rebel almost, and his architecture and his art too, I think, uh, deserve, uh, deserve attention. Uh, unfortunately, this picture is not very clear. The resolution is not great. Some drawings by Leonardo Ricci. Um, as I said, he also painted, and we are going to see a few paintings uh, by him. Um, this is a study for a project which we are going to see later. Now, it is said that in Florence it's very difficult to assert yourself as a modern architect because of the, you know, the, the weight of the Renaissance culture for which Florence is famous. But th there were and there are uh, significant uh, modern or modernist uh, architects uh, born and functioning in, in, in Florence. I like very much this artwork by, by him, but unfortunately I, I couldn't find a higher resolution uh, picture of it. Another painting by him, Leonardo Ricci, another one. And yes, I think architects if they have an attraction for painting, should paint also. Le Corbusier did it too. It's good, to, it's good not to forget that architecture is connected with other arts, painting or sculpture in particular. Anyway, these are just some graphic works. In, in this case, uh, you know, uh, an architectural drawing a book was published, Architecture as a Living Act, because Leonardo Ricci, he himself uh, used these words, architecture as a living act. And he even protested against uh, Le Corbusier. He, he accused Le Corbusier of making uh, l'unité d'habitation, um, you know, some, some kind of a hotel and, and betraying, uh, you know, what, what, what a home is supposed to be. Now we start uh, the trip through his um, built works with this uh, ecumenical center in Praline from 1946. Unfortunately, um, uh, some of the, of the texts um, that, that I show on this PowerPoint presentation are uh, in Italian, me meaning that the names of the works, the titles of the works, I, I took the information from uh, the Italian Wikipedia because in, in English I couldn't find uh, uh, information, significant information. Uh, so this was from 1946. So he was born in 1918. Uh, so he was 20, 28 years old when he built this work. It's not yet, uh, you know, uh, revolutionary, so to speak, but uh, I think it shows uh, coherence and, uh, you know, uh, a sense of uh, modernity that is not indifferent to the usage of uh, uh, some organic materials like stone, for example. Um, 
there's still an architecture that is um, affected in a way paradoxically by uh, um, you know uh, rationalism um, I say paradoxically because you would expect Italians to be highly emotional and in a way uh, you know having nothing to do with what we call rationalism or neo-rationalism but the truth is Italy did have a significant uh, uh, movement in architecture called just that neo-rationalism this is the the model of the work from 1946 leonardo ricci again i i like the fact that he he enjoys working with stone and this is not something that happened very very often in in modern architecture but stone was also used by his professor um, uh, michelucci So the, these are pictures from immediately after the deadly Second World War. Old flower market. Now, unfortunately, I only have three pictures here and not um, great quality, but this is a very important work and I blame myself for uh, having no time to amplify the, the presentation of this important work. I did present it in detail when I talked about Leonardo Savioli, another important architect connected with Florence. And he worked together with Leonardo Savioli, so they did together this old flower market in Pescia, 1948. Uh, again, the, the picture is almost unbearably small, but you can you can still see here, you know, the, the splendid uh, uh, concrete shell uh, or roofing that they did for this, um, you know, uh, flower um, flower market. Again, uh, this is a deficiency of this presentation. I had another one, but I couldn't find it where this particular work was more, um, uh, more uh, presented, uh, more rich. Anyway, if you are interested to see Leonardo Ricci and Leonardo Savioli um, flower market, you just type in on Google images and then you can discover a notion of information about it. Now, this is a factory, uh, the Gotti factory in the municipality of Campi Vicencio. Um, you know, it's a factory, but I, I still think it's architecture. It's not, it's a humanized uh, building for um, a production facility. And the, and the structure has some aesthetical qualities. It's not, uh, you know, just a, uh, an indifferent uh, structure to aesthetical matters. Again, stone, who would expect stone to be used for uh, the building of a factory? It's not very common, no. Uh, a house, uh, uh, Casa Bal Balmain, I don't know if I pronounce well, uh, Marciana, uh, uh, on the Elba Island, a very provocative house. I mean, just look at this. Is it a structural thing? What is it? You know, it's like a unicorn's horn. Um, it's very intriguing. And it could have been, a, you know, a means to arrive in the swimming pool with it, but apparently it goes, I mean, not apparently, obviously it, it, it goes off. Um, whatever it is and i didn't uh, study it uh, carefully enough aesthetically is very very uh, you know striking and provocative leonardo ricci a villa
Villaggio Monte Rinaldi, uh, vicino a Firenze, but, that, but oh, I, I will only show now the studio, his own house, the house of Leonardo Ricci, which is a very, in my opinion, a very, uh, a very good example of what his architecture is. We see here also, uh, you know, on the, on the second floor, we see an artwork by him. Again, the employment of stone. Uh, it's not an architecture that, uh, that uh, you know, turns its back on, on, uh, on, on nature or turns its back on what we call tradition or turns its back on, uh, you know, a certain uh, uh, sensitivity that includes, uh, um, you know, uh, employing, like here, we see a statue, you know, in this uh, alcove, in this opening in the thick wall. Uh, this is not very common. But 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 uh, this architect uh, Leonardo Ricci is uh, indeed a, a very special architect, and uh, maybe because he had this um, you know double preoccupation, if I can call it so, with 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 painting, meaning with art and architecture, he seems to be very he seemed to be very sensitive to uh, to matters which went beyond domesticity. I like this house very much. I, I, I couldn't quite understand because it seems to be ample and uh, it's not clear to me what kind of village this is, how, how big it is as a village. But his house is, um, is a good example of what, uh, of what this architect uh, stood for. And we are going to see also images from the inside. Uh, but here we have a section, we have a plan, but uh, again, the, the clarity is not great and uh, they are a little bit mysterious, not being very, very, um, you know, uh, descriptive. But they, they do generate a feeling of, um, uh, you know, of what, of what this house uh, might be, technically speaking, in terms of section and, and plan. Leonardo Ricci. Now, again, the, the orthodox functionalist would uh, say uh, this um, stair that goes um, up, um, you know, it could be a little bit dangerous. It doesn't have a handrail. It doesn't, but, uh, you know, uh, one is expected to be careful. Uh, plus, if one, God forbid, falls, doesn't fall from an incredible height. The, the stair is also kind of a sculptural element within the living spaces. But we see here that the stair starts from the kitchen or, you know, the space is open. I like the treatment of the pavement within the, within the house. And also the, the stair has a double uh, function. You know, it goes up, but also it helps you arrive at books that are uh, on shelves um, up there, and even even the bicycle, as you can see, is placed on the on the top shelf. Also, an interesting way to to uh, hang the the pots for the cooking from the from the window directly, so they become almost like uh, you know objet trouvé. Uh, uh, you know, sculptural uh, uh, objects uh, on the on the glass of the um, of the um, uh, kitchen window, and the stair itself, as you can see, is quite uh, well designed. Even if, as I said, some I think is uh, could be a little bit dangerous to use. stained glass windows, modern stained glass windows. 
who does something like this these days? Not many people. Uh, he even has them in the bedroom, as you can see them here. Leonardo Ricci. So I guess this is the, the village. You know, most houses have the same spirit, like his own house. I regret I couldn't find pictures with other houses here, just with his own house. Uh, his studio in his own house and his artworks, the paintings, the architect's office. Villa Man Borges, 1957-1958, uh, similar kind of with the, what we already saw. And here he was when he was a little bit more uh, so-called mature elegant as most Italian men are, with the exception of Renzo Piano, who is probably the worst dressed uh, architect in the world. Not as badly dressed as uh, Pablo Picasso. I don't know if you know or if you noticed. Pablo Picasso was totally indifferent to the way he was dressed. I mean, I, I saw pictures with Pablo Picasso that I couldn't believe my eyes. I mean, you know, a great painter like Pablo Picasso, a master of color, being dressed so horribly. You know, I, I read that he received clothing uh, from famous designers who were very happy to donate, not that he couldn't buy them. He was a rich man, but, you know, he received, um, you know, uh, samples of great uh, clothes from the fa most famous designers who would have been happy if the great painter was using them and he would just throw them on him without any kind of consideration for color, design or whatever. Check him out, Pablo Picasso, the worst dressed man, man in the world, not painter. I'm joking a little bit, but not completely. Another villa by Leonardo Ricci. Um, he was fond sometimes of whiteness, but you see here the, the, the astuteness, the, 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 the will of these uh, slabs to attack, you know, if not uh, the sky, then uh, the, the, the nature in, in its proximity. It, it's an, you know, th this is the aesthetic of, uh, of uh, modernism. Complesso Residenziale di Sorgane, no pictures, Edificio La Torre del Complesso di Sorgane. Um, uh, here he collaborated again who, with, the, with the architect who, who they were together for that um, flower shops, flower shop or market, the flowers market. Um, They did some interesting works here. The, the, the blocks of flats are, are very, very, you know, almost dramatic because of these uh, sculptural elements that extend beyond the, you know, the, the limits of, 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 uh, of function, so to speak. Now this is, I only have uh, uh, a few pictures here, but the same kind of architecture, maybe, you know, not uh, bringing anything new. We know that he liked to combine, um, you know, elements of an architecture that was uh, practiced also in the United States, even for, uh, by let's say, uh, Richard Neutra or Richard Neutra, but because of the way he used the verticality of these pieces in stone, uh, his architecture is different and also uh, the connection with the earth and also with the, with the culture of, 
Tuscany, you know, the, the culture of uh, Florence and around Florence, um, it's a different context. But some of his buildings seen from above are so smooth and glittering uh, and, uh, you know, uh, white, like here, the level of abstraction of the roof in, in this building is incredible. You know, it's, I actually don't know how it can be kept this way because of the elements. Underneath, there is a home with its problems, its troubles, its darkness, its shadows, its light. But the roof is, uh, is like a spaceship ready to, to fly. And very thin, in probably concrete very, very thin. And then underneath this uh, fortress-like wall made of stone. Very interesting. I mean, if we look at this building as it is in this picture, we'll say this is a building uh, built in the 21st century, you know, if not by, well, it's not quite Zaha Hadid, but it has a certain fluidity and, uh, and the perfect whiteness and uh, you know uh, the aesthetics seem to belong to our time, not to his time. Uh, uh, church, but here I couldn't find. I guess it was uh, uh, destroyed, and it, it was in the process of being, um, um, you know, uh, brought back to life. Chiesa Valdez di Pacino. I found this picture. It's the only picture I found, and I was very curious, being a church. But I could. I only found models, like here, and another. Uh, there were other pictures of the model, and I understood it was in the process of reconstruction. Maybe it was destroyed during the war, or when was it built? No, it couldn't have been because it was built in 1964. I don't know what happened to this church. Sorry, I don't have other pictures. Now, this is a very interesting work, and I, 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 I was amazed when I discovered the picture of this cemetery. It is a cemetery, but for me, it's a very life-asserting cemetery. Well, not so much. I'm not so impressed by this pyramid. You know, maybe this pyramid is a little bit, uh, uh, you know, provocative towards what we call death because even the Egyptian pyramids uh, erode in time. And I, I find it a little bit, uh, you know, um, too assertive in relation with uh, what this is, because it is a cemetery. But look at this, you know, it, it's, it's a most unusual cemetery. You wouldn't expect this kind of architecture in a cemetery. Leonardo Ricci. Uh, I regret here I don't have a better resolution picture, but we see a very vigorous concrete work, very sculptural. And being vigorous, it means uh, it's, uh, it's uh, uh, you know, uh, life asserting. There is no nostalgia here. <clears throat> there is no, uh, you know, cultural, uh, Melancholia, like in uh, the Brion Cemetery by Carlos Scarpa, or there is no, uh, uh, you know, uh, even pessimism, like in, in the cemetery Igualada by uh, uh, Carmen Pinos and Eric, Eric, Eric Miraes. Here we see an assertive architect expressing sculpturally, uh, you know, uh, life, I would say, not death. Very interesting work. Look at this. Again, who would say that this is a cemetery? Well, yeah, if you see some, uh, you know, uh, graves at uh, the bottom, but, but the buildings above, what do they have to do with uh, our expectations, uh, expectations relating uh, the work to, um, you know, to death? Now, I was actually very impressed when I saw this work. Because yes, maybe, maybe, maybe a good way to, to handle or to, to deal with uh, the afterlife or with uh, you know, the, the, the limits of life is through creativity. And 
this architecture by Leonardo Ricci, in my opinion, does just that. Very interesting work. I never saw such a cemetery. Because instead of being the city of the dead, it's actually the city of the living. Uh, even seen from above, and you see the whole complex. You know, who would think that this is a cemetery? I didn't. It could actually be inhabited. So it pays to be sculptural in your architecture. While architecture is not a sculpture, or not only a sculpture, as Constantin Brunkus thought, that he said that uh, uh, a building is an inhabited or inhabitable sculpture. No, there is a distinction between architecture and sculpture, but sculpturalness, sculptural qualities in a building do help. The building becomes more attractive, more inciting, more interesting if it is uh, animated by a sculptural spirit. A cemetery, can you believe it? Another villa, 1977-98, 1980, yes. I love the way he played with the bricks here at an intersection, you know, uh, meeting between two walls. And I'm uh, reminded of, um, of a fragment of a book by uh, Salinger, an important North American writer, who in one of his writings said, said what does a wall say to another wall? And he answered, I'll meet you at the corner. And indeed, when you have two walls, well, of course, if they move towards each other, they will meet at the corner. And here, the corner is a, an architectural event. And it's actually very logical in a way what he did, but it's also interesting, you know, from a creative point of view. And it's, it's uh, as I said, it's an architectural event. Just this corner where two walls, brick walls meet. Uh, bricks do allow you to be, uh, you know, to weave with them. And that's what we look at here. So he worked well with bricks too, not only with stones. Now we arrive at the last two works, Palazzo di Giustizia, the Palace of Justice in Savona from 1987. Um, I don't know. I mean, do we need palaces of justice? I mean, the very terminology to me is a little bit pretentious. Why does it have to be a palace? But that, that's how it, it is named, you know, the judicial building, the palace of justice. Uh, here we see again the, his liking of, um, you know, triangles and, uh, you know, uh, monumental uh, uh, pyramid-like structures. He built also the one in, uh, in Florence, and that's how we end the presentation. Uh, I like very much the interior, it's, it's dynamic, it's, uh, it's uh, engaging, and let's hope the judicial process uh, is uh, open, transparent, democratic, and, uh, and uh, unfair. Leonardo Ricci the Palace of Justice in this uh, town. And after it, we'll see the Palace of Justice in Florence, which was built after he died. Here is another picture of him.
Now we arrive at Il Palazzo di Giustizia di Firenze, the Palace of Justice in Florence. Uh, no, something wrong. This is the one. And it's, it's monumental and we don't know. I mean, it was built after he died. So, you know, maybe certain decisions were made um, that he might not have uh, agreed with, who knows? But it, in, it intimidates me a little bit, the monumentality of the work. You know, it's, it's, it's um, yeah, it is intimidating. You know, I, I, I wouldn't like very much to enter such a building and expect, uh, it's, it's a big institutional uh, organism, very big. And now we arrive at a, a few more pictures with it. It's similar to the, the one that we saw earlier in that town whose name I forgot. It's just much bigger. And this is in Florence, the Palace of Justice. Now, the problem with justice is that it could be demagogical and just, uh, you know, wishful thinking. Let's hope that this is not the case, but uh, we know that lawyers could uh, defend even the criminal if, if they are paid well. So what I want to say is that the triangle, the, you know, the, the angle at the top, which is so piercing the sky in a way, it's... Uh, uh, maybe a little bit too ambitious from my point of view. But this is the Palace of Justice in Florence that Leonardo Ricci built. And these buildings uh, become bigger and bigger. Uh, Renzo Piano, since I mentioned him already, uh, built one recently in Paris, which is, you know, uh, totally out of scale with the city. It's immense, it's a mega building, the Palace of Justice in Paris, built by Renzo Piano and Associates. And here too, you know, we know Florence, we know about Florence. Well, this building seems to dominate even the Duomo, no? The, the great work by uh, Filippo Brunelleschi. I don't know how close it is to the center of Florence. I hope it's not very close. Okay, and now we go to the second um, architect we'll talk about today. But before um, we do so, let's, let's have a short uh, discussion, if you don't mind. <laughs> 